asking who is the narrator, uh, you're asking me a question that I don't know myself, <laughs> about myself. Uh, like this is uh, because of my conclusion that I've come to, that scripture, whether it's the Torah or it's the gospel or it's the Quran, is a dialogue between God and YHWH. So it becomes interesting while I'm reading it, because I'm really focusing on it, to go, okay, who's this? Is this God or is this YHWH? Um, this can sound like a very high-minded, divine edict, or it can also be read as a tongue-in-cheek, I, uh, ironic, uh, puncturing the, the, the pretension of what it is that that's saying, in which case it's YHWH is saying it. Uh, I don't know how much participation there is in, uh, in the world just for writers generally. I mean, are we making stuff up? Am I, individual, a sim, making this stuff up? Or am I just a conduit for a different kind of conversation at a much lower level than what you get in the Torah or the Gospels or the Quran? Okay. <laughs> the only reason I asked about was Poe the narrator was because after Poe leaves in women, there really is no narration until uh, latter days when it's service telling what happened after Foreman Void. Right, right. And it was one of those, you know, it was, it, it, I just happened to hit the panel in Reeds where Poe says, I've seen every... I've seen you every day of your life. I I know your innermost thoughts, and there isn't a day where you don't surprise me. And I'm like, wait a minute. That that kind of lends itself to the idea that Poe's the one narrating the stuff that couldn't possibly be narrated, like the uh, the First Ascension, and uh, I'm trying to think. There's some other things that just, they, they, you know, it's one of those, you know, I know that, uh, I think it's high society or else, Church and state. One of them has the next issue, the return of the of the all knowing narrator. That's one o two, the sudden return of the melodramatic narrator. And that's why I'm thinking, well, maybe the melodramatic narrator was Poe. Uh, that would be one of those questions where um, Poe probably wouldn't know. Like, obviously, he decided to opt out of society in any kind of conventional sense and obviously developed um, whatever kind of connection that he had as an artvar to Cerebus and Siren, and particularly in the case of Cerebus, was either omniscient or, as has been said of Satan, at least very well informed. Uh, in which case, uh, it, he becomes a proxy for me in the sense that I'm pretty sure Swedius Paul had no idea who Dave Sim was, but he would know the concept of who Dave Sim was relative to the wedding as well. Well, that's, uh... Mind Game 2 is the one where... I When I when I get around to uh, high society, I'm probably going to send up the question of, so, when did you know that Poe was an aardvark? Because in Mind Game 2, it you know, there's the bit where service is, you know, putting Poe off his game, and, you know, you know he mentions the Regency and Poe's like, I've never set foot in the Regency, and service like, no, you asked where I was staying, that's where I'm staying. And right. uh, if it's if Poe is omnipotent at that point, then Poe would know that service is messing with him, and that's when your brain starts getting twisted into a pretzel trying to figure out what's going on, and then you remember it's just a comic book and you can go on with the rest of your day. <laughs> well, that's, uh, 
see, I wouldn't think that that was the same Salenti as Paul that turned out to be the art part. Um, I think, uh, again, Salenti as Paul was a name that illusionists adopted because, um, you know, the sleight of hand magician type illusionist and uh, people who uh, had a firm awareness that um, everything is pretty much an illusion. Like the whole um, physically incarnated world doesn't actually exist. You, you have to get to uh, quantum physics before you actually go, you know, actually that's true. It's just uh, uh, wave particles flying in loose formation. They just seem to be solid objects. Um, same as when we first, the first Salenti is called that we meet is like a, a drug guy. Like he's, you know, he's smoking hash and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think that's the Salenti is called that, uh, that we finally meet in, uh, in mind. Okay. That's what I was just going to say. So the first two mind games, that's not the quote real Poe. That's just a Poe. Uh, well, the question would come in of if it was a, let's, let's call them a, a lesser Poe in those two instances. Is the lesser Poe under uh, what is called the aardvark jurisdiction? And that would be, Wait. that would be the, that's, I mean, I know that in Reed's, when uh, Cerna slash Seren accuses him of being an illusionist, you know, he is greatly offended, and I have a, with what you're just saying, I'm thinking that actually lends itself to the idea that the illusionists are founded by a lesser Poe in the name of the Aardvark Poe, who doesn't want anything to do with it, he just wants to sit in his room and play chess. Right. Which also raises the question, is the Aardvark Soentius Poe the highest elevation Soenti is both. I'm going to go with probably, only because of the uh, trial at the end of Church and State, where Cerberus and Astoria see the echo, well, not the echoes, but the previous incarnation of the Cernist and Poe. And Poe right. remembers all his lives. Yeah, that's one of those. Um, I I I do go uh, uh, at least in, insofar as um, uh, the kind of, the kind of stuff that Alan Moore is into. I do uh, acknowledge the validity of as above, so below. So I assume that uh, I assumed that the story that I was telling by creating a character with an elevation uh, above a two-dimensional character, but not uh, three-dimensional like me, I assume that that reiterates itself above me, which is why when I started, uh, when I started reading the Bible, it's like I'm going, uh, yeah, why are you resistant to calling that God? Why are you always talking about uh, whoever it is that's in charge of the universe? <laughs> it's like, well, who does that sound like to you, Dave? Um, and at that point, yes, I got, I got very self-conscious about, uh, oh, hey, wait a minute, I didn't know I was doing that. Yeah, I know you didn't know you were doing that, but now you do know you're doing that, and you do know that you did do that, so what are you going to do now? Right. Which, you know... And the, an the answer to that is read lots of scripture aloud, fast a lot, uh, pray, uh, fast in Ramadan, and try to keep my nose clean as, as clean as possible because I think I've been mucking around and stuff that I'd probably be better off not mucking around in. Well, that's uh, Douglas Adams has, in the last book they published under his name, 
which is it's the beginnings of his next book that that he died before he could finish, and then a series of articles. And one of the articles, he was an avowed atheist, but he was talking about feng shui, and he said, just because you know there is there are no dragons. The whole point of feng shui is you have to allow the dra energy dragons to flow through your house. You know, and that's why you have to move the lamp there and have a potted plant there and stuff. And his point was that there are no dragons, but if you design your house to let the dragon come through and you suddenly realize, hey, you know, this is a better layout for my house, everything, you know, I'm more productive, you know, it, it, the light's better and all this, doesn't prove there's energy dragons, it just proves that that's the way you should have laid out your house. And so, not saying there's energy dragons, but... Maybe we should think like that, which, you know, it's the same thing of there is a God or there isn't a God, depending on where you fall on that line. But if you live like there is a God and he's going to be mad at you for what you did last Friday, so you're not going to do what you did last Friday ever again, you're going to live a better life. And, you know, you're, you know, you're not going to wake up hacking up a lung. You're not going to wake up trying to remember where you are because you went blotto last night and woke up on a park bench. You know, you're, you're going to have... Oh, you will. Oh, you will for a period of time. It's like one of my, one of my first things, um, once I was aware that, okay, you're, you're talking about an omniscient being, that means he knows everything that you're thinking. And was, uh, okay, um, cigarettes and alcohol are off the table. It's like, I, I understand that I'm... I'm supposed to give those up, but I'm not giving those up. So I just want you to know that off the top. And it's like, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and it's like three years later, the cigarettes are gone. Five years later, the alcohol is gone. And that's... I'm trying to remember. There was there was a famous quote about... Uh, or no, it's, it's the old cabinet of, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I think it's far better served just, like I say, try and, try and figure out how to keep your nose as clean as possible. Um, what, what does that mean to me? Where, where, where do I have to improve and what do I have to improve on? And just work on that, stick to, stick to your own plate and interpret it the, the best way you can. And then hope for the best. I, I'm, I'm still convinced. Um, there's a lot. There's going to be a lot more unhappy stories on Judgment Day than there are going to be happy stories. And uh, I think a lot of people who thought they were they were doing good, uh, which I don't even try and get into because it's like I, um, I, I, I don't really see that see it that way. I see myself as a as a massive reclamation job. Um, like I've just passed through the threshold of uh, having been celibate for as long as I was sexually active. And it's like thinking back, you know, 20, uh, 21 years of, uh, of scrubbing the frying pan and 25, 21 years of dirtying the frying pan. I don't know if I'd give me... Uh, SDA on Judgment Day. Well, you know, that's what, that's, when, uh, years ago when you had said, you know, your, your bags are packed, you're ready to go whenever God wants you, and I'm like, yeah, my grandma said that when she turned 60, she died when she was 91. You know, that's, yeah. that's, you know, your bags are packed, you're ready to go, but you might not be getting on the bus for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's probably not a good idea to pack your bags that early. It's almost like you're you're daring God to keep you around for another thirty years. You know, it's uh, no any anybody who thinks he's going to pack his bags, no, that's, you're 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 just asking for it that way, buddy. <laughs> that was my uh, when my grandma died. My aunt took a picture because she she'd been saying for years, when I die, I want to go in my sleep. And, uh, she, so I go, I, I'm at my grandma's apartment, we're helping clean everything up, and my aunt shows me this picture, and I'm, she's like, you want to see the picture? I'm like, not really, and she shows me, I'm like, 
she looks like she's asleep. It's like, yeah, she, you know, nice smile on her face, you know, just looks like she's dreaming. And I'm like, well, that's, you know, what she wanted, but at the same time.